A lot of new woodworkers are trying to get started in the craft without spending a lot of money, and they often ask me if they can get by, at least for a while, with a cheap set of box store chisels. My answer is usually to buy good chisels, but start with just a couple of sizes, such as quarter and half inch. Of course, good chisels are about 20 to 40 bucks each, while a whole set of genuine Chinesium chisels can be had for 10 or $20, for like four or five of them. So I understand the appeal that goes with wanting to start cheap while you learn the craft. Today, I'm gonna to help you turn one of those cheap chisel-shaped objects into something you can do actual woodworking with. I'll also give you some recommendations if you're in the discount chisel market, and I'll put links below this video to chisels I recommend and other free sharpening resources we've made. To begin with, don't mistake a brand new chisel as a ready-to-use chisel. Any blunt wedge will cut along the grain and soft wood. A sharp chisel must slice end grain cleanly without crushing the fibers or just creating dust. A fresh from the package chisel is okay if you're on a construction site and you just want to bang on it with a hammer, but that's not what you need for precise woodworking. Every new chisel has to be set up before you can use it. Expensive chisels need a little bit of work. Cheap chisels may need a lot of work. It's one of the trade-offs that comes with spending less money. The first step to setting up your new chisel is to flatten and polish the back. A sharp cutting edge is the function of two planes coming together. The back must be treated the same as the bevel. If it isn't flat right up to the cutting edge, your chisel's not going to work properly. The fastest way I have found to flatten the back of a chisel is with a powered system like the WorkSharp 3000. I can put coarse sandpaper on there, or better yet, a CBN wheel, and it'll make quick work of the job. If you have a WorkSharp and you want a link to a CBN wheels, look in the description below this video. But since you're buying cheap chisels, I'm going to assume you don't have a WorkSharp or a Tormac or a Diamond Stones or even Water Stones. If you're on a tight budget, you're most likely looking at sandpaper. So that's what we're gonna concentrate on today. Start with something around 300 grit. Now you need a dead flat surface to put it on. A piece of plate glass is a great option. You could even get by with a granite floor tile. You may be able to just spray on some water and use the surface tension to get the paper to stick. But spray adhesives do tend to hold better, especially if you get a little aggressive with the tool. A pack of inexpensive chisels is like a box of chocolates. You might get lucky or you might bite into a turd. You'll know what you've got within the first few seconds of sanding because you'll be able to see how near to flat the back of the tool is. If the sandpaper is only leaving scratch marks in the center of the tool and not near the cutting edge, you're humped. The tool has a convex back and it's going to take a lot of work to remove all that steel in the center. If all the chisels in the pack are like that, especially if the scratches are far from the cutting edge, you may consider returning them and trying a different set. If the scratch marks are around the edges of the tool and not in the center, you are one lucky woodworker. You have a hollow back or concave surface that will take far less work to set up. Either way, the goal is to get not the entire back flat, but you need it polished at least three quarters to an inch down from the cutting edge. So you not only establish the intersection between those two planes, but you also give yourself a reference surface for paring wood. What I mean by that is often you'll use a chisel to shave the surface of a workpiece, usually to remove waste around joinery or to level two surfaces, such as trimming a dowel flush. This requires the chisel to lay flat on the wood. If you don't have a flat reference surface on the back, you'll have trouble paring. And if that reference surface does not go all the way to the edge of the tool, for example, you got tired of rubbing to flatten the back, and so you left a dull line along the back of the cutting edge. You've created a back bevel, which will not properly pair the wood fibers. It can be a pain in the tuchus to go through this, especially with inexpensive chisels that have all sorts of hills and hollows in the back, but you've got to do it right. And the good news is, once you get the back flat, you won't have to do this again unless you use the tool so much that you grind that bevel down an inch or so and your flat reference surface disappears. If the tool needs a lot of work to get it flat, you can use a grit that's coarser than 300. In fact, you can go as coarse as you like. But remember, we aren't just flattening the back, we're also polishing it. The coarser the paper, the deeper the scratches left behind. Those scratches will then have to be taken out with finer paper that leave shallower scratches and so on. 
You can't use 80 grit to get it nice and flat and then jump up to 1000 grit to polish it. That would take forever. You must work your way through the grits just as when sanding wood. If I used 80 to get it flat quickly, then I would follow up with 120, then 220, then 400, then 600 or 800, and finally 1000. Why did I choose those particular grits? Because those are more or less the grits found in many fine sandpaper assorted packs, which is nice, so you don't have to buy a whole bunch of different packs of sandpaper at once. Again, start around 300 and just see how bad the chisel is. You may be able to work up from there. If not, step down and work your way up through more grits. By the way, if you want to know what type of sandpaper to buy, generally it comes down to silicon carbide or aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is cheaper and it works faster, but silicon carbide lasts longer and I tend to prefer it. And in fine grits, it, those may only come in silicon carbide anyway. I also prefer wet dry sandpaper because I can lubricate that with water. If you're using coarse grits like 80 or 120, you're probably grabbing the cheaper paper backed aluminum oxide sheets that you have for wood. Those usually can't be sprayed with water. So be sure to blow them off frequently to clear them of metal shaving so they don't clog up. Now let's talk about back flattening technique. There isn't any, at least not much. On the first grit, when I'm trying to just remove lots of steel, I move the tool in any direction that I want. I'm applying even pressure to keep it flat. Again, I'm trying to leave scratches from the cutting edge down the back about an inch. Don't leave a little corner of that cutting edge untouched. Be thorough. Once the back is flat, you can move up to the next higher grit. This time, move the tool in a consistent direction. Side to side, diagonal to the right, diagonal to the left, whatever. Just pick a direction and stick to it on that grit. This will create a consistent scratch pattern on the back that you will be able to differentiate from the scratches left by the previous grit. When you can't see those old scratches anymore, you know you're done with this new grit and you can move on to the next one and change your direction so that you get a different scratch pattern. Once you get up to 400 grit, you should start working the bevel as well as the back. Now this could be done freehand or with a honing guide. I'll link to an inexpensive guide below if you want one. But chisels aren't difficult to sharpen freehand, so that's what I'm going to show you here. Feel for the bevel by rocking the tool back and forth just a little. Once you feel that it's flat, give it some downward pressure and pull it back across the paper. Go slowly at first until you get comfortable with holding the angle. Some people like to lock their wrists and move their arms backwards. Others lock their wrists and elbows and move their whole body backwards at the feet. We recently made a video about freehand sharpening with a lot of tips. I'll link to that below. For most beginners, backwards motion is the easiest way to sharpen a bevel freehand. So you won't be able to change the direction of the scratches as you change grits of sandpaper like you do on the back. So instead, use your finger to feel for a rough burr along the back of the cutting edge. That little bit of metal that's been pulled off the bevel by the sandpaper, that's your signal that you're ready to move on to the next grit. Start the next grit on the back, which will remove the burr from the previous grit. And then just as before, pick a, a direction and create another scratch pattern. Then do the bevel again, feel for the burr, and move on to the next grit. Most of the work was done on that first grit. Once the tool is flat, these successive grits that you're using to polish and refine it will take much less time. If you try to use the whole surface of your sandpaper, it should last a pretty long time, especially with the finer grits that you aren't using that much. The coarse grit that you used a lot to get the back of the chisel flat, that may have to be changed between each chisel. You'll know when it's time because it just won't feel like it's cutting anymore. It's better to use some extra sandpaper than to spend an extra couple hours on the back of a chisel. Of course, go through each chisel in the set on each grit before you swap your sandpaper out or you're going to be swapping sandpaper back and forth all day long. Once you get through 1000 grit, that's when I like to stop on the sandpaper and switch to a strop. You can get finer sandpaper if you like, but a leather strop with some honing paste is cheaper in the long run and it will produce a better edge. We've made two videos about stropping, which I'll link to below if you wish to continue your sharpening education. So how do you know when your tool is sharp? Well, you can shave hair if you like, but we're woodworkers, not barbers. Get a piece of soft pine, the white stuff that dents easily. 
If you can shave the end grain without crushing the fibers, your tool is as sharp as you will ever need it for woodworking. Is that all it takes to turn a cheap chisel into a good one? Nope. That's what it takes to make a cheap chisel usable. How long it remains usable is usually directly related to how little you paid for it. Cheap chisels are made from soft steel that tends to dull quickly. If all you do is lightly pare soft woods, even the cheapest chisel will work for a decent length of time before you're back to the sandpaper to sharpen it. Of course, when you go back and sharpen, you're only going to have to use a couple grits, maybe 600 and 1,000 and then your strop, you're done flattening backs, hopefully. But if you plan on using a mallet on a cheap chisel, such as to chop a mortise, be prepared for that soft edge to fold over and dull quickly, especially in hardwoods. Forget about using a $2 chisel on white oak. These are the trade-offs. The cheaper the chisel, the longer it takes to set up, the more often you'll be sharpening it, and the less likely it will be to hold up to hard wood. The goal then is to find something in the middle that fits your budget and lasts a decent amount of time between sharpenings. So here are a few that I've had success with. First are the good old blue handled Irwin or Marples chisels. These are pretty decent for the money. Stanley Fat Max chisels with metal caps on the ends are decent too. The DeWalt chisels with the capped ends are pretty much the same thing as well. These all have a metal shaft inside the handle that connects the cap directly to the blade, which makes them very strong if you plan to beat on them. I really like these for outdoor construction projects because they're very rugged. Narex chisels are a great value. They perform more like a fine woodworking chisel than the rugged Stanleys or DeWalt's, and they're less expensive than the marble sets. Plus, I like the wooden handles better than the blue plastic. A small step up from the Narex chisels may be the Stanley Bailey chisels with the brown handles. I think the steel is a bit harder, though it's difficult to find that kind of information. I like these, but to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that they're worth the price jump over the Narex versions. Now, if after watching all that you have to do to get a cheap chisel ready to go, and the limitations that you're just gonna have to live with, if you decide you wanna invest in more of a mid-range chisel set, that will be easier to set up, that will last longer between sharpenings, and that will hold up to hardwood better, then I highly recommend the Stanley Maple Handled Sweetheart Chisels. These are not terribly expensive, though they aren't cheap, but they are really nice chisels. I think they'd be considered premium chisels in most weekend woodworking shops. So, my mid-price recommendation are the Stanley Sweethearts. My budget recommendation is the Narek set, but the blue uh, Irwin Marlboro's chisels are decent too. These are woodworking chisels for cabinets and furniture. If you're doing rough construction work, then I recommend using the Stanley Fat Max or DeWalt's with that metal cap and internal steel shaft. I'll link to all these below and to some sandpaper if you need it, as well as the other sharpening videos that I mentioned if you want to continue your education. See you next time. It's just a couple of cuts. Your ears will be fine, right? They would be if you had your Isotunes Bluetooth earbuds in, because you'd already have your ANSI certified hearing protection on while you're listening to your favorite music and podcasts. And you'd be supporting a small family business at the same time. Please use the link below this video to learn more and to show them you support what we do as well. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up, or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.